Happy Belmont Stakes Week, everyone. Dan Torchman here with America's Best Racing, joined as always by my good friends Christina Blacker from TVG and Scott Coles, the NHC champion, back with us to talk not only Belmont Stakes, but a jam-packed card on Saturday at Belmont. Nine graded stakes races? Seriously, nine graded stakes races. Three of them are winning your in races for the Breeders' Cup. And then, of course, the big one, the Belmont Stakes will cap things off. As always, we'll be looking at these races through uh, the lens of stats race lens and looking at the different angles and the different, um, you know, uh, research tools and, and the customizable searches that we could do uh, to find winners and to put you on winners. Uh, hopefully some long shots here along the way. So Christina, let me start with you on Saturday. As I said, we've got Great races, top to bottom, dirt races, turf races, sprints, routes. Is there any particular type of race where you find stats race lens to be most helpful? I would say, Dan, the thing about these big cards that makes stats race lens so helpful is when you're looking at form on horses that are coming from so many different places and you can have a speed figure like an equibase based speed figure and even those class figures to kind of fall back on because sometimes... I think it can be difficult to compare these horses, whether they're East Coast, West Coast, in between. It's difficult just on the surface value of it to compare them. I think for me personally, I get a little bit more out of the late pace figures when I'm talking turf racing. So if I had to find one kind of specific spot, that would might be it. But just overall being able to use the product to kind of narrow down the pretenders from the contenders in some of these fields. Yeah, you know, going into uh, the Belmont Stakes in particular, I think a lot of us think that at this point in the Triple Crown Series, we know a lot about most of the horses. We think we know who the contenders are. We think we know who the pretenders are. But then, of course, there are pitfalls there, right? Because you may uh, overlook a thing or two. Scott, how do you avoid complacency? How do you check your work using Stats Race Lens? Yeah, it's definitely easy to get complacent in the third leg. Although when you have two different winners, I think um, kind of makes you feel like anything can happen. You're going back to one of those years and there's... Um, a good chance there's going to be three different winners. So um, double check all my angles, but the, the beauty is that they're saved for you. So if they don't light up green or light up red for a positive or negative angle, an angle that's used in the past, um, it means that it's in the last few weeks or in the last five weeks or however long since you've looked at it, it's, uh, it's not as hot or cold as, as it was going in. And you can, you can constantly see what's coming up and you should always test new ones because um, you know, Churchill's much different from Pimlico is much different from Belmont. I mean, they're just different services and there's so many things you can test and you can do it all by, you know, just starting with Belmont on every angle you test and then just see how things have played out there with the, wherever your mind takes you. So um, I always try to do that uh, to make sure that, you know, you're not getting complacent on a day like this. Yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, you could test for for trainers, you could test for pedigree, you could test for post positions. I mean, you could do all these tests that are specific to Belmont Park, um, or you could broaden it out to, uh, you know, maybe trainer shipping into the New York circuit on big days in general. Uh, there's so much to dig into. So um, let's do that. Uh, just one quick thing before we get started. If you've never used Stats Race Lens, you go to equibase.com backslash offers and there are a bunch of new offers that you can uh, sign up for this week in particular uh, to get a discounted rate on a Stats Race Lens subscriptions. If you're a new customer, you've never tried Stats Race Lens before, uh, there's a promo, an unlimited one month subscription for a dollar, a dollar. Uh, it's promo code SRLM1E. So check that out uh, at equibase.com and use that promo code for a dollar subscription if you've never had uh, if you've never had one. And then there are other uh, uh, discounts there available for uh, existing customers as well. So um, check that out. All right, let's jump into the action. We're gonna start with the sixth race on Saturday. Uh, it's the Jiper Stakes, which is one of the three win in your in races for the Breeders' Cup. So we're now kind of pivoting to, to the Challenge Series, the Breeders' Cup Series uh, leading up to the Breeders' Cup. Uh, that's a win in your in for the Turf Sprint. Uh, Scott, you actually got pretty lucky here. This was the race we assigned to you. As it turns out, I think it's probably one of the better uh, betting races on the entire card. Yeah, well, unfortunately not the way I'm going to use it, but um, <laughs> I, I looked and looked. And so I hate taking chalk in a turf sprint because I think over time, that's just kind of where you have a good chance to see the widest range of outcomes. 
So I'm not going to only use the favorite number six bound for nowhere, but I couldn't get past him for a few reasons. One, um, if you, if you look at the, um, the replay of the shaker town that just happened, um, this horse <laughs> all the way outside you can't see it as well as you can on the head-on but you can get the picture that wants to be close and broke well off of it you can kind of see mid-pack but it's an eighth or ninth here had to come insanely wide and usually in a race this short with a fairly qual quality field um usually you don't overcome something like this so the i mean the horse is ultimately going to get around didn't panic which was which was nice um i think it's always a it's always a good sign um when the same jockey rides back who was just able to which is joel rosario who was able to just kind of get this one to still relax and do something as normally does not do still stuck behind imprimis here imprimis gets out first has a big, big jump and is a great horse and still somehow manages to run imprimis down i just thought it was ultra impressive um i just don't think this is a very good addition of the japer now if bound for nowhere doesn't win then i don't know where to go but i thought that was all really impressive doing something the horse doesn't like doing i mean the horse is almost always unless for a bad break or something weird happens always first or second at at the first call um and i just thought being able to overcome something like that was super impressive um second race of the year it's always a little concerning when you see a horse this spaced out but it seems like it's always worked for this horse i mean this is is for the horse this is good to be this lightly raced at age seven is kind of crazy um but the horse always seems to show up and run um the things that drew me i mean if you look at the pace projector for this race which is kind of a cool tool. And this is a good example at the bottom pace projects to be a slow one. The advantage goes to the horses that will be close to the early pace. A lot of, a lot of my favorite upset chances in this race are deeper closers. Um, and a race like this really concerns me. There's just not a lot of horses that can go. I wholeheartedly disagree where they have bound for nowhere on this pace projector. If that horse didn't last, something went horribly wrong or it broke even worse than it did in the last race. Um, so taking that into account, um, I think Bound for Nowhere is one of the only horses that could go 22 or sub 22 and not be completely gassed in doing it in this race. And I think that is a, that's a huge advantage. Um, in the past, this race has been won by closers on times where um, it's almost always been pure sensation. I feel like pure sensation has been the pace setter in this race forever. Um, but there's no pure sensation. There's no hidden scroll. There's no, a lot of the horses that have made this set up um, for the closers. So I, I just think bound for nowhere has plenty of late pace show that it can overcome. He can overcome trouble. And I feel like if he wants to go, he could just take the lead here. I mean, there's no true, I mean, if you start, sort by run style, I mean, outside of the MTO, which is, has nothing to do with this race. Um, Another cool thing you can do is just click the little eye on the MTO and take him out of the pace projector as well um, on the left-hand column. It's just another tool that we've talked about before. If you click number seven um, and you could just take him out. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's just no, there's no front runners. There's no leaders in this. Bound for nowhere is probably your, your best bet. Um, if he, if he breaks well, Joel can, can just take him all the way. And I feel like he's got plenty of, pace and uh back class to finish i mean he doesn't have a ton of grade ones on his resume but this is is out of a grade one i feel like you're gonna see because there's just there's no grade one horses in this i mean got stormy was um very concerned in where got stormy is in her career i mean i'll be rooting for her as always um but that last race was just super super flat and disappointing um what, what and the defending Alexandra, though Alexandra's one who's you know run you know who's obviously ran a huge diaper last year three for three at Belmont it's, you're a little worried about the age there as well not the age I'm, I'm worried about the setup I mean three for three at Belmont I mean you can't ignore that I mean she could win but I mean she's won 
when she won the race last year, I mean, they, they went super fast up front. I mean, Hidden Scroll and Pure Sensation and maybe one other horse were going at it and came from so far away that I just, I'll be really impressed if, if uh, she can pull that off again. You, you're going to get the price, but I'm also a little concerned. I mean, not that Rosario wouldn't choose Bound for Nowhere, but Joel Rosario's almost every Alexander racer has, and he's jumping off. I mean, I don't, I don't ever like to see that. Yeah. Um, while, while we're looking at Alexandra, I want to get Christina's take on this. I, I think this is something we may have touched on in the past. And, and as we see these races more and more, these graded stakes, especially on, on big race days where the horses are racing off Lasix, um, when you see a pattern like like Alexandra again, it might just be it might just be age or it might just be not not having as great a setup. Although it looks like they were going pretty fast in some of those recent races, and you see that decline uh, in terms of the productivity there in the last three races off Lasix granted one of them clipped heels lost the rider uh, Christina how much is that concerning to you I think really Dan the only race that is concerning to me is the most recent race perhaps mm-hmm. but I can almost explain that one away for her as well if you want to look at the last three races of Alexandra's pattern so the incident where she lost the rider was so bizarre because she actually clipped her front foot with another horse next to her their front feet just clicked together Hmm. at one point so that was completely draw a line through it toss it out so bizarre and rosario actually when he fell that day he pulled the bridle completely off her head as he fell Hmm. so then she was loose without a bridle on the track for five minutes or so the wishing well she went to the sidelines afterwards and she propped coming out of the gate i think there's a case there to be made for the fact that something so kind of traumatic happened to her the time before that she kind of reacted to it a little bit and then the last time I would be worried, but she also hasn't performed well over a good turf course in the past. So maybe there are enough excuses with the trouble two and three back, the good course last out. I mean, she didn't really run well over a good track at Keeneland in the Breeders' Cup. I think that Barry Irwin and Team Valor, they're so bullish about clean racing that if this was a mare that was having trouble without Lasix, they probably would have retired her by now. Mm. Okay. Um, you mentioned Scott bound for nowhere, obviously is your top pick here. How are you going to bet this race? I, I think there, there's a price or two that, that you like, and you might be able to pair up maybe in an adapter. Yeah. So a couple of things. Well, the other thing I, I forgot to mention about bound for nowhere is also is a, is a stat. It's just interesting how on fire Wesley Ward is to start this meet, um, doing it with mostly chalky horses and favorites. But if if you just take um, this meet and this, look at the turf sprints that you'll see on the screen, six wins out of nine starts and the other three hit the board. Again, all short prices, but this one's going to be a short price. I mean, he is just absolutely on fire. Not a huge sample size, but he's obviously got all of his horses going in the right direction um, and, you know, draws Joel Rosario. So I, I love the situation, but I will be looking all the way up until that day because I hate, again, hate doing this. It is nice because it starts the pick six. So betting it, you could single down for nowhere. And, and if you're wrong, just come right back, pick, pick five. Um, I do like that situation quite a bit. So you don't have to waste a bunch of tickets and you don't need savers because you can save either with a double or a pick three that will pay a lot if bound for nowhere gets beat. Or you can just say, if I'm wrong, I have, I'm w- saving a ton of my bankroll for the pick five or the pick four, um, whatever sequence you like. So I, I do like that. But if you, if you want to, but an exacta, um, I mean, going through some of the, the Mott horses, um, I've always liked chewing gum. I just think might be, might be in a little over his head here. Um, I prefer Casa Creed. Um, he's got some serious back class. I mean, faces facing the likes of hit the road. Huh? Got it right that time. Hit the road. <laughs> um smooth like straight who just came and ran a big one over the weekend i mean there's just there's some big names um you know ivar holiday win 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 i mean just digital age back in the day mm-hmm. if this if it turns out i mean some horses at the stage in their career turn into very good sprinters we don't have a large sample size here but past the first test on this track at seven furlongs. I mean, if it can continue, continue to cut back, um, I think this horse is very interesting going forward. And I think sitting in the two hole can save plenty of ground and just work out a good trip. And I, um, will be using Costa Creed a little bit. Um, Stubbins, I can't figure out the number 10, um, you know, in last year's version of this, I thought, I mean, he was close to that close enough to that pace, but I just thought, 
he should have held on better than he did. Um, he's only had one race since then. You can make a case for soft ground. You can make a case for bad step. Um, but just, again, lightly raced for a horse that I'm not sure really would prefer to be lightly raced. I don't know the full story there. Um, Christina probably knows a lot more about that horse than I do, being a, a Doug O'Neill West Coaster. But I um, believe the horse always had talent could stay close enough in a paceless race where it could be very dangerous. And then Gregorian chant, I, I think Saez will probably try to be pretty aggressive. I'm not sure if this horse, what this horse wants to do. Um, but another horse coming, you know, from the West coast, that's very talented in a sprint race. Um, and you could even make a case for some by a, and the problem is that I'm naming like almost every horse here because <laughs> once you get past the favorite, I just don't know what to do with this race. So yeah. right now I'm leaning single in the pick six maybe a little bit of a, some money on Costa Creed or one of the others, if I um, see something I like and then watch for scratches, see if anything else happens. But um, right now I, I think I'm just going to single and then move on if I'm wrong. Before I move along, Christina, did you have any thoughts? If not, we can, we can go on. to I just will touch on real quickly is Gregorian chant, the eight. Uh, I have said this in the last couple of weeks on TVG a few times. I think he's the best turf sprinter we have right now. Uh, it was a pretty dramatic move when they cut him back from the mile and a half to the six furlongs. I kind of thought it was crazy as he was entered that day in the clockers corner, but you watch how quickly he can close. And you noticed from the true odds page, he is a pretty strong late pace figure over the rest of this field. He's significantly faster in the late stages than you know, many of the others in here. Now to Scott's point, we might not have the kind of speed to set it up for him but he can really motor home. And I think that Belmont is probably even going to suit him a little bit more than a California track. I mean, it's a little bit bigger, a little bit, you know, easier on those turns and then to just really close as they square up headed for home. So I would be interested to see what he does. Cause I think for the second half of the year, and when we start to talk about the Breeders' Cup, I'm, I'm curious to see how he stacks up against the East coast horses. Cause I think he's the best that we have on the West coast right now. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, another Breeders' Cup uh, winning your in race is going to be race seven. It's the Ogden Phipps grade one mile and a 16th on the dirt. Uh, always top notch uh, fillies and mares in this race. And this year is no different. When I initially looked at this race, I thought, geez, this is going to be a, a pretty quick handicap. Right. I mean, uh, I, I see a couple of horses here who I know we talked about the complacency. Right. Like I know these horses. I, I think I, I, I know what to expect here. But the more I, I stared at it, uh, the more I landed on a, a horse that I didn't expect to land on, really, which is a good thing, I think, when, when you end up seeing something that you didn't initially expect to see. Um, the horse that I like is Valiant, uh, the two horse. Um, this one is super interesting to me. You know, we could just start by looking at how she's run on the dirt in, in her last three races. Um, in the Eatontown uh, last August, that, that race washed off. She ends up posting... Um, a really nice figure there, uh, 103, which I, I think to that point was, was her largest figure. Um, then she comes back in the spinster, stalks the pace while wide, and then just blows past She Dares the Devil, earning a 112 there. But what I really want to do is look at the replay from the Breeders' Cup Distaff last year. Uh, Valiance draws the eight hole, eight hole here in the Distaff. And so what you're going to see mostly is her chasing Monomo Girl, who breaks from the 10 post. Um, What's interesting is, you know, I think people maybe overlook Valiance here entirely because they remember how like enormously Monopoint Girl ran, but into this first turn, Valiance, um, you'll see there on, on the outside, the only horse taking the turn as wide, if not wider than Monopoint Girl is Valiance. And she stays out there. She, she continues to stalk um, three, three to four wide throughout and then she takes the turn for home wide and we could kind of jump ahead a little bit. Um, you know, in this turn for home, obviously Monomoy girl gets the jump. She's in better position and, and look, let's face it. She's just a better horse. And so Monomoy girl kicks clear, but Valiance keeps going with her. I mean, she, she essentially keeps pace with her here um, and, and doesn't really lose any ground in the stretch. Um, if anything, she, she kind of gains a little bit late and to me, that was visually pretty impressive uh, for, a, for a horse making just her third start on the dirt, uh, facing one of the beasts of the division that we've seen in years. 
So now the question is, can Valiance come back off of this long break? This is her first start back since then and win against this classy group. Well, I decided to do this. Let's take a look at Todd Pletcher, how he has done under similar circumstances. And again, you could customize these searches on stats race lens down to essentially what he ate, ate for breakfast that morning. And so the filter we put in here is specifically for this range of distance past five years, more than 180 days off. So roughly this kind of break, six to seven months off in graded stakes. And you see there are 15 starts, four wins, six in the money, 27%, not the largest sample in the world, but again, you're talking about graded stakes and specifically off of this long break. Is a horse capable of coming back for Todd Fletcher and, and, and doing this and pulling this off? And I think that you see there pretty clearly that um, there is, um, you know, there is precedent for it. So, um, you know, not completely out of the question on that front. We'll see. Uh, to my eyes, she hasn't run a bad race on dirt. And if she could take uh, just, just even a slight step forward, I think she's in good position. And I especially like her uh, from the perspective of if we go to the true odds page and kind of take a look at the pace projector here, it you have Valiance here on the front. And I think that this, this may ultimately update and, and adjust because Valiance is not going to be up front. The horses that are going to be battling for the lead are going to be Latruska, the three horse, and She Dares the Devil, the five. And so... Um, in her most recent race, Latruska, we saw what she could do when she's when she's left alone on the lead. Uh, she ran a huge race in the Apple Blossom and won, but that's not going to be the case here. She did, there's the devil. We know that her best game is is going to the front, and so all that to say, I think Valiance also gets a nice pace set up here, and I don't want to completely discount Swiss Skydiver because I think she's been the victim of a combination of uh, you know less than stellar. Uh, uh, rides at times and and when she's gotten the right ride and when she's gotten the right setup she's generally come through I mean she's she's super classy and so I think Swiss Skydiver is one even though she's five to two on the morning line I'm hoping I'm probably wrong here that maybe she gets slightly overlooked and you get a bigger price on her but for me it's Valiance followed by Swiss Skydiver and then I'll just mention briefly Queen Nakia the four horse if, if you want just sort of a, a bomb uh in, in, you know to kind of throw in as a saver in the back end of your exacta this one has a sneaky look to her made a big move from off the pace at this distance in her seasonal debut uh to win the Royal Delta at a big price uh that 114 Equibase speed figure when you see that circle around the speed figure that, that green circle that means that's the highest number for any horse in this race so who would have guessed that Queen Nakia, when you're looking at all these other horses, uh, owns the highest Equibase speed figure. Um, look, they, they tried sending her a bit longer last out in the top flight. It didn't work. We, you know, we talked a moment ago about Wesley Ward and, and the tear that he's been on. Safi Joseph has been on uh, an equally ridiculous tear um, everywhere, but, but at Belmont as well. And so um, this one has a sneaky look to her, and I think she probably rounds out your exact or trifecta if one of the two that I mentioned don't don't fire. Um, but look, that's my hot take here. I, I think that uh, Latruska and She Dares the Devil are out of the money. Um, Christina, react. <laughs> I love where you're going with Valiance. You've talked me into her. I mean, especially off the replay. I'm, I love that, and it was a great angle as well, and I think that Aaron Wilman, Eclipse Serbid Partners, they do such a good job managing, you know, their horses. The only thing that I, I'll say is Caleb Keller, who works with me on TVG all the time, and he preaches this. He says, anytime you only have two speed horses in a race, bet one of the speeds. Uh, yeah. Bet one of them, at least, on your ticket. So if I'm going to choose, I actually prefer She Dares the Devil. I think that she has shown how versatile she is, you know, everywhere she goes. And not that Latruska isn't, but... She's coming off such a big race at Oakland. I wonder if Latruska can run back to that or not. We saw how much the Apple Blossom took out of some fillies last year. All these candy comes to mind. Cece comes to mind. I mean, those, those big races there over a track that can be a little speed favoring can be tough to overcome. So uh, I would say if you have to choose one of them, maybe she dares the devil on some tickets as well. But, but I like the case for Valiance. I will be uh, right there with you after that, after those angles and whatnot. Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that when there are two speed horses, pick one of them, because generally what happens is one doesn't end up doing what you expect them to do, right? And, and you have one that, that is, actually ends up being loose on the lead. But I think the scenario that you were, you were starting to describe there is really like the Kentucky Oaks 
set up, right? Where she dares the devil is kind of maybe just off of Lutruska, like she did in the Oaks, and then is able to, you know, kind of, you know, basically, you know, run past her, you know, as they turn for home and that sort of thing. And so it's very possible that plays out. And then we don't get as, 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 as a hotly contested a pace as, um, as, you know, maybe I'm envisioning. Uh, Scott, before we move on, uh, any, you want to throw out a, a quick name or a pick or a thought on this one? Um, I mean, just because of pure numbers and stats that I'll more get into later, but the Brad Cox um, going longer on, on the dirt, two turn dirt races right now has also been on fire for a long time. Um, so She Dares the Devil and Bonnie South both will get a look from me. Um, if I had to listen to myself during the Derby more, they took second and fourth. Um, just he's just hitting the board at such an incredible rate. I've always thought Bonnie South's kind of cool. Um, and one, you know, second off the layoff and could get completely ignored here. And you get Cox and Rosario, um, and is not going to be anywhere near the top betting choice, which is great. It's definitely a step up, but um, has run some big races in the past and always kind of finishes pretty well. So if it does fall apart, that's just another one that I'd be looking at. I, I like everything you said about Valiant and Swiss Skydiver, but I also think. Um, it's interesting. I'd have to go back and watch it again, but she dares the devil and Latruska faced off on March 13th and she dares the devil made the lead and never looked back. Um, so that's also an interesting setup. And if it plays out like that, or if they're going to change up the plans, but, um, I'd assume that, uh, Drew will be pretty aggressive when she dares the devil and try to try to repeat that and say, come get me. So, um, we'll see that it's, it's a very tough race right there. Um, so I'm ex really excited to watch that one. Yeah, same. All right. Um, we can move on to race nine. Race nine is uh, the Met Mile. Uh, always, um, you know, uh, a staple in the New York uh, graded stakes circuit, a race we all look forward to every year. Big winners year after year, uh, you know, classic names. Um, Christina, this is your race. Uh, and, and I think it, the race basically goes around Nick's go. Is there a way around him? It does. And I think it's going to be, it, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, he'll be one of the heaviest favorites that we have on the day. Let's start with the PPs and let's start just with Nick's go in general. I think if you are going to try and find him in a weak moment, perhaps this is it. Only because you can see, you know, from his record, he has those wins in a row that were so, so impressive. And then he went to Saudi and didn't uh, quite show up as well as we have seen from him in the past. So his Saudi Cup effort he ended up fourth across the board. If he's coming back off that kind of a, of a layoff, you know, maybe this is the day that we're going to have the opportunity to beat him. So I just wanted to talk about some of the other horses and if I am going to try to beat him, but where that would be. So let's go back to the rail. Let's start with mischievous Alex. Uh, he's another horse that's just in very good form right now. And Safi Joseph, you mentioned how strong he has been as of late. Uh, he took over the training of this horse sometime through kind of the end of the summer and you see those three consecutive victories in a row if we open the chart from the january 10th race this isn't as relevant to this particular race to the met mile itself because we're talking about an optional claiming event but i just wanted to show it just so that folks at home see some of the tools that you have on stats you see those yellow circles around most of the runners in here these horses have all come back to win out of this race the yellow means that it was actually a race that is considered less as far as the class goes and company than the race that they were in, in that January 10th effort. But I think this is just one of those things as far as key races goes, stats will customize that for you. You can actually select how many horses you want to see win in order to be kind of flagged that that's a key race. If two horses need to win for you to take note of that race, if three need to win, that's fine too. This particular one had four. So I don't know if mischievous Alex can upset Nick's go. They have a similar style. And I think the rail is going to be a tough spot for him because he runs with a real heavy outside extension cut blinker, even though he's tactical, not being able to see horses all the way to his outside just might not, not help him. Let's go to the three horse though in here in silver state. So he's actually going to be my pick. I'm going to see if we can't upset Nick's go. And we'll start with the replay of, from his race on November 27th of last year at Churchill Downs. And the reason I've gone to this race 
is because it's a one turn event. His recent races have all been around two turns at Oaklawn. But if we go back to that November 27th race at Churchill, you'll see Silver State uh, when he is, let's see, is this the, the same replay that I'm looking? There we go. Okay, let's come down the back stretch. That camera angle kind of confused me for a second there. What I like about him is the fact that he's, he's kind of tactical enough to keep up with these horses early on. I think that the cut back and the turn back and distance is going to be just fine for him. He's the number two, as you can see right there in the windshield thoroughbred silks. And he really just kind of keeps pace with these horses early on. This was right after he came back after a little bit of time on the sidelines through 2020. And he's just been on a tear since then. You're looking at five wins in a row for this horse. Uh, he's never competed at Belmont but he's gone everywhere else without any kind of trouble. He's been competitive at the fairgrounds, competitive at Keeneland, at Churchill, at Oakland, as I mentioned. And here as they turn for home, he's going to overtake uh, Shasha Shake Me Up, who was setting some pretty quick fractions and just go on with it. He'll end up two and three quarters of a length clear across the board. And he would follow this with that trip to Oakland, the win in the fifth season, the win in the Essex, the win in the Oakland handicap. There's just a lot to like about Silver State off this race. And I thought it was pertinent to the Met Mile because we're going back to the last time, again, that he was around one turn. So as they cross the wire, uh, we can go back to the past performances. He's a son of Hard Spun. Hard Spun, for my money, is just one of the most versatile stallions out there. I think he doesn't really get enough credit. I also wanted to look at his dam's PPs. Supreme, a daughter of Empire Maker, the late great empire maker. And she, if we open just her past performances themselves to see what she did on the racetrack, she was more of a sprinter. So I think that's where he gets some of this tactical speed from, you know, you know, you have the versatility on the top side of the pedigree. And then you have the fact that this mare herself was very tactical and quick. And that's where I think he's getting that great kind of combination. He's a light sort of handy type of horse. And I love seeing what he's been able to do. There's her PPs up there, just kind of looking through. She was useful. She was precocious. She won first time out uh, through a couple different racetracks, a stakes winner as well. So I like the pedigree. I like what he's been able to do around one turn. And then if we go to the true odds page, uh, they talk a little bit and they will show you a little bit about the pace as Scott kind of pointed out to us early on. Uh, pace projects to be a slow one. Advantage goes to horses that will be close to the early pace. I really think that just kind of based on what we saw from Silver State, he's going to be a little closer than where they think. There are some other tactical horses in here, but I don't think that Ricardo Santana is going to let them get too far away from him on this occasion. And then hit the late pace button as well. He's got a good late closing kick. He's not far off from Dr. Post. So even though, you know, he can keep up early on, he can still kind of finish his races off late. So I'm, I'm going to pick Silver State on top because I think we might be in an opportunity to maybe catch Nick's go in a vulnerable position because he's off that layoff and off the long trip. And then Dan, I just wanted to show a quick stat because I think there's a horse in here that you should use based on his trainer's record in New York. And I think you kind of alluded to this a little bit uh, off the top of the show. It's with regard to the four Lexitonian, Jack Sisterson just filtered this to today's circuit. So I'm talking about races in New York. And then we went straight grade one. We're going grade one only for wow. Jack Sisterson in New York. He's three for 10. And these horses are prices. The median win payout, $18.40 on the board with another one of them. So 40% in the money, 30% win percentage. If you're playing some bigger tickets and you have the opportunity, I mean, I would throw him on because I think Lexitonian, there's a grade one out there for him somewhere. He has been defeated a head and a nose for a grade one twice maybe this is the day for him if you if you have a little extra money to include him and i bet him to win both times so i remember Me too. <laughs> yeah, so did i and i had him in double i had him in doubles on derby day and i wanted to cry oh god yeah um you know and in terms of trainers you know you made that incredible case for for silver state i, I will say steve Asprison doesn't doesn't ship ship too many to belmont in particular um, and, you know, I think we could remember, I, I mentioned some of the past winners of this race in particular, Matoli, B Jersey won this very race. Um, and of course, Steve winning with, uh, with creator, uh, back in 2016, winning the Belmont stakes. And so, um, that was a tour de force, Christina, showing off every single possible function of stats race length that, that you could for one horse. Trying, trying to do whatever <laughs> we can to, uh, find a way to beat a heavy favorite. I, I think. There's a chance he's vulnerable, so let's let's give it our best shot.
All right, Scott, I'll, g- I'll give you a last word on this one. What do you think? Uh, Knicks go or Knicks don't go? Um, I kind of want to dig more into workout reports and kind of see what anybody that I can find's opinion that means something is saying about how he's working and how he's coming back. Cause I agree. Sometimes they go overseas and they just don't come back the same. So hundred percent agree that if you're going to go against Nick's go, this is definitely the time. Um, just want a little bit more information because every other horse in this race is capable if Nick's go isn't the same, but if Nick's go is the same, I just think they're running for second, but um, I hundred percent agree that it'd be a great spot. And whether you're playing cash or tournaments, you're going to get a ton of value if you could beat Nick's go in this one. All right, we're going to jump ahead to the big one, uh, race 11, the Belmont Stakes. I will say just just a brief mention on race 10, which is the Manhattan. Uh, one of those Jack uh, Sisterson horses, uh, Channel Cat, is back in that race after winning the Man of War last out, one of those grade one wins. Also domestic spending in Colonel Liam. I thought that was a fascinating race um, and one to really dig into uh, when you get the time. Uh, let's, though, uh, for our remaining time, talk about the Belmont Stakes. Of course, back to the mile and a half distance that we've uh, all come to know and love of the Belmont Stakes after being at a mile and an eighth last year. Um, I've always felt, and, and really it took me a while to learn this lesson because I'm not, admittedly, I, I'm not a big pedigree guy. Like I, I've tried to learn as much as I can about pedigree and apply it appropriately, logically, not, not over apply it because I think that's, that's a pitfall too. Uh, but I've always said that the Belmont Stakes is the one race, I think, at least in the Triple Crown series, and and really in terms of all the big three-year-old races, where you've got to look at pedigree, and and, and history bears out, especially recent history, that, you know, the Tappets of the world, the the Curlins of the world, you know, uh, those kinds of horses are are the kinds of horses, uh, the Stallions, whose, you know, whose whose horses that you want to use uh, and look to, because the reality is, on most years, a good number of these are just not going to be able to get this distance. And so um, I think there's that discussion to be had here. Of course, your favorite essential quality is a Tappet, went into the Derby five for five, came out of the Derby arguably running one of the best races, if not the best race, considering how much ground he lost and and, and how much trouble he had uh, getting jostled out of the gate. And then you have, you know, also on the Redemption Tour, Rock Your World, um, the seven horse, uh, Joel Rosario up trying to make up for the, uh, the snafu, uh, out of the gate, uh, in the Derby and, and really try to rediscover, uh, what it was that made him so brilliant in the Santa Anita Derby. Um, we could start with, uh, Christina, Christina, let's, let's just, first of all, talk about pace since we like rock your world. Do we think it's Rock Your World alone on the lead? Is it Hot Rod Charlie there? Is it Essential Quality Pressing? How do you see the race setting up from a pace perspective? I do think it's going to be Rock Your World on the lead. We can go to the pace projector uh, just to kind of help us out a little bit as well. I think, you know, with Rock Your World, he, he there he is. He's the seven and they've got him right up there. He got away with the front end in the Santa Anita Derby, but he was setting some pretty quick fractions and they weren't really respecting him that day. I think that's why nobody pressed him and was, kind of keen to go after him but he does have to carry it a lot farther for the Belmont and I love this horse I loved him going into the Derby I'd love to see him kind of redeem himself if he can I think he's going to be pressed by Hot Rod Charlie though if we're kind of looking for who's going to be right there I don't think Hot Rod Charlie will be too far off of him especially with Flavian Pratt kind of being out here in Southern California and knowing the the quality that we have in rock your world and then i see Luis saez not letting essential quality get too far off the pace either dan i i think he'll be on his own but i think that second flight is going to be pretty tactical he's not going to open up some big margin on these horses at all and i mean joel rosario is not one to want to go and take the lead so i think you have to factor that in a little bit as well but it's so clear on paper that this horse is the quickest early on. I think he just has to go. Okay, uh, Scott, tell us what you think about the pace, and then uh, tell us who you're uh, who you're going with. Um, yeah, I'm a pretty stubborn person, so <laughs> rock your world. I don't think has it really got to start running yet since the Derby. Um, that was just 
a gut-wrenching five seconds for me. Um, was alive to a lot of great stuff and too heavy on Rock Your World. But, you know, that's, it's going to happen in a race like that. And the, I, the concerns are that the inexperience, was it, is the horse now going to have braking issues? Was it the crowd? Because the horses haven't raced in front of the crowd. Was it the track? I mean, there's just so many questions of the horse that's lately raced. We all saw the Santa Anita Derby. If he runs that race, I, I just still think he's the most talented horse in here. And I think he's the most talented three-year-old, but, um, you know, we'll see that, that going to the lead strategy. I really, really hope that works out. Um, you always worry about a horse like the five thinking that their only way is to just fly out there or yeah. Hot Rod Charlie can, can definitely be close. I don't think any of the others are fast enough to stay anywhere near Rock Your World if he wants to go early, but how much does that take out of him? Um, the gallop in the Santa, gallop out in the Santa Anita Derby was a monster. Um, I, I think the distance will be fine, but I think um, the break is just going to, you just don't want to see another discouraging break in the horse to have to overcome things that just didn't seem like he ever settled in that race and just was so thrown off by everything that happened. Um, maybe, a, maybe a little bit of a middle move, but um, I think, I think he got hit so hard by central quality and sandwich. I mean, Joel's foot came out of one of the stirrups, I believe I heard. And I mean, there's just, if I thought he was the best going in, I just don't see why I would change my mind. Um, so he just didn't get a chance. So as far as the pace, I'm hoping that they just send, um, and I'm hoping that pace projector is right, but it, it will be interesting because you know there are going to be others that aren't going to let him get too far away. So mm -hmm. we'll see. He's just he's got a high cruising speed, and I think he'll get to show it off. And I'm just hoping he breaks. Prefacing this with, you know, the thought that you know we love you, but let's let let's game out your nightmare scenario, and let's let let's assume for some crazy reason he doesn't get out of the gate. Hot Rod Charlie's loose on the lead. Is, is he even remotely a, a possibility to wire this field? Um, I mean, how loose are we talking? Because, I mean, he, he would be if they just completely ignore him. But I just think, I don't know, we'll get into this more later, but I, I just think there's other horses that are capable of staying close enough. And I feel like out of all the horses in the Derby that are running back, I mean, Hot Rod Charlie – got the best trip I mean and not by no means was it a perfect trip but I mean he had first he had first run he saved a ton more ground than essential quality and got out first and kind of kind of moved over into essential quality almost around that turn and just had the advantage all the way saved I mean and was finishing inside of him so I mean I just think should have beat essential quality by more that day so I mean I guess if he's crazy loose and the seven, you know, if Rocky World and that that five horse are nowhere to be found, then I mean, any horse with his ability gets that loose. I mean, you're definitely talking about problems, and you don't want to let the horse get that far away. It's not the Belmont is not that favorable to closers if 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 it's just a loose leader. I mean, there's been plenty of people that have wired fields in Belmont. Granted, most of them have been really good horses, but. I mean, you definitely never want to let a horse. I think that horse has got a lot of talent. You don't want to let a horse, especially one that's improving like him, um, get loose. Okay, so that was that was the doomsday scenario. Let's move back to the happy scenario. Rock Your World breaks cleanly, is on the front end with Joel Rosario aboard. I know we said anecdotally, sometimes maybe you don't want Rosario on the lead of the horse. You, you, you found an angle here that actually backs up, you know, feeling a bit more confident in Rosario uh, on the front end. Yeah. So we, we kind of had this discussion um, about how I like, I think, I think you guys for the most part agreed that he, I, we think he's one of the best, if not the best finisher in the game. And he's just so strong and he just gets everything out of a horse in the end, but he's actually had a really good run with, with front runners. And it's not just the one year. I know it's only 16 starts, but I mean, you look at just the last year for, for now and you can play with it yourself and go back as far as you want or filter it out. But I mean, it's a heck of a success score and the win percentage is extremely high. And it's, I mean, you wouldn't think that from Joel, but he's done really well when he's got the projected speed and um, an angle like this, I filtered out with the true odds because, you know, I want to eliminate horses that, have no chance. Um, a 
according to the Stats Race Lens database. Um, rarely is a good jockey going to ride a horse with no chance. That's the beauty of being a good jockey. You don't really have to do that. But um, this kind of filters it out for you, and you can play with angles like this. But he's done surprisingly well with with speed horses for someone that's known as a finisher. So um, I'm more confident with this with this angle. I'm hoping that he can work out that trip and be sitting first, if not first, second, if someone's going too fast. All right, Christina, I know uh, you have a lot of interest in the horse just to the inside of Rock Your World. I do. So as we talked about kind of going into the Kentucky Derby, I loved Rock Your World. He was my top pick that day. And I also really liked Known Agenda. And what ultimately kind of pushed me in the direction of Rock Your World for the Derby is the fact that the profile of a Derby winner tends to be a horse that's pretty close to the pace. They're either pressing the pace on the lead, just not too far back. I think we've seen that pretty clearly over the last, you know, six, seven years, ever since they brought the point system around. But for the Belmont, I think you can come from a little farther back. You think of that big mile and a half oval, you've got plenty of room in the stretch to run a horse down. So I think the profile of a Belmont winner suits known agenda a little bit more. Uh, he's another horse that had no chance in the Kentucky Derby. The rail we knew would be tough. It ended up being tough for him. Uh, one of the things on his PPs, though, that I found pretty interesting is if you look at that Florida Derby, you can see the green circle around the speed figure there. Here we go with that horse that comes in with one of the best figures of the entire field. So this, to me, goes a long way against these horses because you're talking about that number right in the face of the number that Hot Rod Charlie and Essential Quality ran in the Kentucky Derby. I also, if we pull up the replay from the Florida Derby, let's just go from maybe the quarter pole home. You can see how this horse has a huge stride, how he gets rolling. And once he's kind of out in the clear, he really can focus on his target ahead of him and run horses down. And I think he even has more to give. I don't think we've seen the best of known agenda just yet. And so for kind of just the fact that this track suits him, it's his own track, it's home for him. Todd Fletcher has won the Belmont three times. I think this might be known agenda's day. Everything wasn't really working in his favor for the Kentucky Derby, but it seems like it will be uh, working in his favor for the Belmont. He was getting out a little bit. I know a couple of people talked about him kind of wandering a little bit in a stretch there in the Florida Derby. I think he's just a little green at that point still. You'll see a more professional horse at come this weekend as well, just because he's had the opportunity to, to have a little bit more seasoning and encounter the whole kind of pomp and circumstance of the Kentucky And Dan, I know you did too, so I think what we have is pretty similar, but the one that I did, and I just started with Bernardini at the top because he was the sire of Bourbonic, but you can do this from any of the horses in this field. You take the sire, and then I wanted to know on dirt, and I went right at 12 furlongs, right at the top. So you're gonna end up with a pretty short uh, sample here just because we're talking about not that many mile and a half races that happen. And then I wanted to filter it to show all. I wanna know how offspring of these particular sires do. We know that Taffet was gonna be a strong influence that he's already sired three Belmont winners. And then it wasn't really a huge surprise to me that, that there's a big, percentage in the favor of the offspring of Curlin as well. So tap it 31% when you're talking about dirt races at the mile and a half. Curlin, who is the sire of a couple of the horses in this field. So you do have to give credit not only to known agenda, but to overtook for this at 22%. He's had four winners at the mile and a half. So to me, the profile of a dirt of a Belmont winner really suits known agenda. And I think this race is going to set up for him a little bit better than the Kentucky Derby. And I think he has the ability to win either one if he got the right setup, Dan. Well, this graphic does tee me up perfectly because uh, while I agree with both of you, I think Rock Your World, I think Known Agenda, and, and I think a horse that we all respect in essential quality are all very live and logical win contenders. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way to, to kind of make a nice score here, whether it be with an exacta or or kind of hammer in a try or, or something. Obviously we have a smaller field, a little bit of a different dynamic this year. And the price that I like in this race is the horse way on the outside overtook. And I like him for sort of the inverse reason why we sometimes land on horses 
coming out of bigger fields where they may have encountered trip trouble. And that is because he's coming out of a race in particular where I was really high on him, but it was a small field. And I think small fields sometimes, especially going long on the dirt or even on the turf, can really distort um, the, the, the level of race or the caliber of race that a horse ran. And, and doesn't, if you just look at the, at the horse on paper, you may not get a real sense for, um, you know, what they did in that race. And so l- let's just take a look at the Peter Pan stakes. Um, you know, th- there's going to be nothing sensational here that's going to jump out at you, but the horse on the rail is overtook. He's the one. Um, and, you know, what, what's important here is, is to stress that this horse does not have any, an, any gate speed at all. And so naturally um, the, the horse is up front, you know, a- everyone ahead of him is, you know, they, they, they just, the, the horse in the lead, I'm trying to remember his name. It's like something, uh, what the, what, what the heck was that horse's name? I, I'm only spacing on his name, but um, he, he was a horse stepping up in class. And then he had the eventual winner behind him in promise keeper. Um, but they're not, you know, they're not going fast at all. They, they do a half in 48 and three and they go one thirteen and one. And you could see just based on, on overtook his running style. He's just there kind of just, you know, plodding along, just, just running his race. But he makes a pretty, what I thought was it was sort of an eye-catching move right here, um, where he starts to kind of look like he's going to about like he's going to sweep past them here momentarily, um, and he comes up to their outside. You can see he's going to be widest of all coming off the turn, and at this very moment, you're like, hey, if the, if this horse can accelerate, maybe maybe he goes by, but ultimately he can't. And the reason he can't is because Promise Keeper and Nova Rags. Were going slow the entire time. They were much closer to the pace and and had had several lengths uh, jump a head start on Overtuck, and so you know they held on. Now keep this up for just a moment. Overtuck, in a moment you'll see, galloping out ahead of Promise Keeper, looking real good, looking like he wants to keep going, looking like he wants to keep running, and we talked about that pedigree. This is a horse that, look, he may not be good enough. Like, at the end of the day, a central quality may open up a 10-length lead in the stretch, or Rock Your World might do that as well, and, and there's going to be no catching them. But if, if you want to – if you ask me, who give me a horse who, who I think is going to be doing some, some, some of their best running late, I think it's going to be overtook. And, and he's 20 to 1 in the morning line. I think you're going to get at least 15 to 1, but maybe it's as high as 25 to 1. Um, so for me, overtook is a very logical play in the exact as I'm not sure if he's good enough to, to win this race, but I think I can make, a, I can pretty confidently say that I think he's going to hit the board. And in fact, I would be surprised if he did not hit the board. Um, I think of the, the horses that you expect to be coming from off the pace, I'm not buying Burbonic, uh, Rombauer. I do worry about regression jumping from a mid eighties, you know, um, sort, sort of, you know, a, a number that, that he had been running over and over again. To, to now jumping to that 103 um, at, you know, 95, 92, 87, 78. I think we're going to see some regression here. And look, I'll look real silly if Ron Bauer does the same thing again and, and actually actually repeats his preakness. But um, I have some doubts about him. And so I think of the horses coming from off the pace, I think overtook for me is uh, sort of a logical play. Um, I started jumping ahead a little bit to where I started talking about other horses, but the plan is that we're all going to discuss each of these horses now briefly, uh, starting at the top with Bourbonic. Um, Scott, let's start with you. This horse ran a really big race, obviously, in the Wood Memorial. Uh, the horses coming out of that race, the horses he beat in that race, haven't done much since. Um, and then, of course, um, he finished 13th in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, what do you make of Bourbonic here? Um, I looked at him and then I, I write notes in the columns of my pps and i just wrote no um so that's no. pretty much it <laughs> i agree with you i mean if it's going to be some bomb the only bomb i want would be overtook just because i think i'm not completely convinced um that was an all-out effort last time right. i'm not sure if any any of the bombs have any chance but um bourbonic is not the one i would want right uh christina bourbonic any hope yeah, I, I can't make a case for him either. I mean, I, I thought that Dynamic One, who he beat in the wood, might run an okay 
race, you know, himself when he came back in the Derby and he really didn't. So this, the strength of who he has defeated isn't quite there. I'd love to see Kendrick Carmouche win a Belmont. That would be awesome. I'd be rooting for Kendrick, but I cannot make the case for the horse on paper. Okay. Essential quality. I think we're all like, yay, thumbs up. Not a very sexy pick, but we think that essential quality hard to imagine him finishing worse than second. A fair. I would agree with that. I mean, I think if you liked him going into the Derby, you have to be pleased with the performance, right? Of course you want to win, but he overcame a lot. And he, whereas some other horses, you know, had trouble and, and gave up, he was pretty tenacious out there. Uh, Ron Bauer, let's, uh, let's reopen that discussion. I, I kind of gave you my quick thoughts and that I thought that he would essentially regress off of the, the Preakness effort. Um, Scott, what do you think? Um. I actually did have him in the Preakness. Not didn't play it hard enough because I was unfortunately moving that day, um, which always how it goes. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I've just had a sad win. triple crown. Yeah, it was horrible. Triple crown day. <laughs> it was not what I wanted to do at all. Um, a lot of complications we can talk about off air, but um, <laughs> just a sad story for me. But the uh, so little little concerned that Pratt would win the Preakness and still opt to ride Hot Rod Charlie. There's always politics involved, mm. but it sounded to me, everything I read, and I would assume our California source would be helpful on this again, Christina, but it sounded like he had his choice and he, ch and he ultimately chose Hot Rod Charlie. But is, am I missing anything there? No, I think you're correct because I was sort of suspecting that perhaps going into the Derby, they made a multi-race commitment to Hot Rod Charlie, and maybe that was coming into play, but that's not the case from what I've heard subsequently. So yeah, I think you're right. He did make the choice to ride Hot Rod Charlie, but I think the way that I would kind of explain it away is Ron Bauer, all the decisions of where he's run have been made by their owners, and they've looked for a conservative route for him for the most part, targeting races that they really thought he could win, like the El Camino, and then of the three triple crown races, the Preakness, you know, with some horses that don't come back from the Derby looking like it might be easier here and there. I think that it's all gone according to plan for them. But with Hot Red Charlie, it's just been a more ambitious campaign. And I think Flavian has a little bit more, a little more faith in him. Although I will say kind of pedigree wise, Ron Bauer is probably a horse that, that can get the mile and a half a little bit more than Hot Red Charlie for, for what I would see. Yeah. So what's, where do we land? I mean, are we using this horse or are we not? <laughs> I think he can come back actually. I, I'm, I see what you say about the, the regression off that last race, but I think what really contributed to him moving forward is the added distance. So I, okay. I think he might run another big one. Yeah. I wrote that um, my note on him was basically that I was worried about the, not that Johnny V obviously is, is any like downgrade to me. It just, um, just any time a jockey is good as Flavian has the choice and as much as it was a tough choice, it's just a little concerning that he would be wrong. I, I just don't, I trust him to be correct that hot red Charlie has a better chance than Ron Bauer, but Ron Bauer, the other note I made is it looked like can, I made a note that it just looked like any added distance is always going to be a plus. So I agree with Christina. I just think the horse is going to grind. I think got pretty nice setup in the Preakness and it's a very good point of how easy of a path they took, but you know, still, still won a huge race, beat some good horses, not nearly as good of a field as this or the Derby, but I think at a distance, you never know. I mean, this is a horse that doesn't have a ton of races and could be peaking at the right time. It's the, it's the beauty of this three-year-old season as it moves on, as you start to see who's going to improve and who's going to, who kind of peaked early on. So um, definitely, Definitely will like the distance we'll be using as a B or a C type for me in multi-races, um, but can't ignore completely for me. For what it's worth, I think as recently as Monday, uh, Umberto Rispoli jumped off of Maxim Rate uh, in the gamely and uh, Maxim Rate won. So um, <laughs> it, it, they don't always choose correctly. Um, oh, I agree. So there's that um hot rod charlie um i think we've gotten little strands of uh, of opinion here i think generally we're i think we're all having a hard time envisioning a scenario in which he wins like what is the 
scenario? I mean, is he loose on the lead? And, and like to, to Scott's question that he asked earlier, like how loose can he realistically get? I mean, and then if he's not loose, is he running down Rock Your World and, and, and essential quality? Like, like what is the scenario? So Christina, what do you think? I think he gets a, a decent trip from the standpoint of he's going to be the horse that's sitting right off of Rock Your World, I think. And if Rock Your World falls apart, he has that opportunity to capitalize. But I don't think he can hold off a horse like Known Agenda if he comes flying. So I, or the central quality for that matter. I see him probably hitting the board. I, I can see him third pretty solidly just from the trip and the fact that he's tactical, but I don't know. I don't, I, I mean, he's a, he's a good horse. Don't get me wrong, but I, I don't see him winning. I see him right there in between everybody pretty much pace wise. Okay. And Scott, you're, you're a little lukewarm, huh? Yeah. I really like the horse. I just think, yeah, it's, are you going to be going fast enough to make the lead? And how fast would that be to actually make the lead if nothing happens to rock your world? Um, and I just I just think every time I go back and watch that Kentucky Derby, I mean, just got such a better trip to me than Essential Quality and even Known Agenda, who got squeezed back. Um, I, how Rod Charlie just had a better trip than all of them. If he was going to – I still can't understand how he didn't go by. That stretch run, I just thought he tipped out. I thought him and Essential Quality were both. I mean – Time will tell if the outside of the track wasn't playing quite as good as the inside. I don't think we have enough information quite yet to make that determination, but um, I don't know. I just thought that was his best shot. I don't know how much a better of a trip he could have asked for um, than that. And it just seems like essential quality to me. I just don't see a scenario where he's fast enough to be in front of Rock Your World and good enough to hold off the other horses we had talked about and just just doesn't seem as good as essential quality if they both get a similar trip. Okay. Uh, moving over to the five horse. Um, this is uh, without a doubt uh, the horse with the, with the best name in the race. Um, <laughs> we, we can all weigh in as, as to where that came from. France Godin. I feel like Christina, you would know the genesis of the name if anybody here would know it. Yeah. I have no clue. <laughs> I feel like every time I see something about this horse on Twitter or online, it's because something just bizarre has happened. I mean, what is going on? I, I, I think Ricardo Santana Jr. jumping aboard is probably a good thing. He's a strong rider. I think this horse, he, he seems like he's mentally a little immature. He's going to need some strong handling. So uh, good luck to Santana on that one. Let's not forget, I mean, Rosario uh, chose to ride this horse over Concert Tour in the Preakness. Um, Scott, any, uh, any scouting you're getting from, uh, from Dubai or from Japan or from anywhere that, that, that's pulling <laughs> this horse? Yeah, I just don't have those contacts right now. Um, <laughs> I need, need them. I need them oftentimes. Sometimes I'll ask uh, Pete, our friend Pete Fornatel for uh, – Yep. advice on the, the European horses but yeah I don't know we're it's a horse that you could see you know sat close to that pace um in the Preakness I, I just don't know I, I thought the trip was good enough and I thought when he kind of ducked through the rail um I thought he was gonna have a lot more I thought it was gonna get real interesting I was like oh man um didn't do enough research in this horse this horse is just gonna f just fly on fly through the rail and take the lead here and then he just just kind of never really got through um, so that, that's concerning, you know, cause the distance is getting much longer. And if you didn't do it that day, um, I mean, could improve, but just not for me. Let, let me make a small case for this horse. It's a very small case. <laughs> and, and, and that is, um, from everything I've, I've read and, and heard about the horse, uh, first off, I mean, if you look at the travel he's done, went from Japan to Dubai, back to Japan then to Baltimore, a lot of travel within a, about a, a five, six week period. Um, you know, obviously, you know, did, did not run a great race in the Preakness, but if you want to cut him some, you know, uh, some slack for, um, you, know, you know, for maybe kind of just getting acclimated to his surroundings, I think that's one thing you could do. The other thing is in watching some of his earlier replays, which I watched before the Preakness thinking like, does this horse have a shot? Um, you notice that he doesn't break well. He's like notoriously a bad breaker. And he actually broke better in the Preakness than, than he had broken previously. But where that left him was that he was actually in range early. And then he made that move. And then he sort of flattened out. 
Um, in this case, I think he would benefit from breaking poorly. And like, you know, <laughs> you know, in, in the hopes that, that he doesn't break well again, and he goes back to the way he usually breaks it. Look, logically, I mean, if you saw the way he closed um, in, um, in Dubai, he, he was running all right late. And then, and then Rosario just kind of let up on him and just didn't like, you know, essentially did, didn't ride him out to the wire. And, but, but he, there was a moment there where it looked like he was going to start going by horses. He ran into traffic and just stopped. Look, this horse, you know, I, I can go on record as saying will not win. I'm mean, just probably going to, this tape will be used against me later on. This horse will not win. But would I be entirely shocked if he, if he, if he made a move late and finished third or second? No, I like wouldn't be entirely shocked. So anyway. I think you just jinxed us though, because all three of the horses that are, we have on top, R2 is outside and you, he's going to take a right hand turn out of the gate, break poorly like you want him to. And you just screwed, you just screwed us all. That's what, you know what though? That, that's a very valid point. I hadn't actually envisioned that. And I'm glad you mentioned that because now it's a concern as, as Scott reaches for a, a beer, I think. And just, just to take no, it's, it's just, an, just a different, just a fruit drink. No, nothing okay. crazy. All Not right. there yet. Hopefully we, we, we won't need the beer this early on Saturday. Um, all right, the six horse, known agenda. Uh, Christina made a great case for the horse. I am, I'm actually really high on known agenda as well. Um, loved him in the Florida Derby. With a better post, I would have been a lot higher on him in the Kentucky Derby. Um, and obviously, um, you know, stands every chance to improve in this race. Uh, Scott, thoughts on unknown agenda for you? Uh, it's another horse that I just can't, I just can't figure out completely. Um, Thought we would have seen a little bit better of a run saving the ground in the derby, but did get pinched back. And you listen to everything that, you know, Todd was saying, first of all, he doesn't normally talk too much about his horses. And he seems like incredibly happy with where this horse is at going into the race, which is a good thing. Um, also said that they just missed getting the spot that they planned for in the derby by like one or two horses. And then ended up getting shuffled back um, by quite a few spots more than they wanted to be. Um you know, we just don't, we don't, there's a lot of things we don't know. My concern is that I think the Florida Derby is starting to look like a rough race, but we haven't seen everything come back from that yet. Um, I, you know, up in the air, horse definitely has talent. Definitely, if you see horses hooking up um, and for whatever reason, essential quality isn't um, up there to take advantage. I mean, this is obviously the next most likely horse to take advantage of it. So there's, not leaving off my ticket isn't going to be um, – I don't think I'm quite as high as maybe you guys are because I'm a little still concerned about um, that Florida Derby form. It depends on what figures you look at also, and I just think that's just the beauty of these races. We'll find out if the Florida Derby is better than we thought or if it, if it wasn't. Um, you just kind of learn as you go and hope by the end of the year you can figure it out. So, um, But uh, nothing completely against the horse. I just, um, I just want to see something from the Florida Derby come back and run well. So. Yeah. Um, this will be a, a good start. Yeah, well, you, you've got to, I mean, you got to start putting lines through some horses. I mean, you can't bet every horse in the race. And so, um, right. obviously, um, you know, that, that's part of it. But known agenda, Christina's top pick. Scott's top pick is Rock Your World, the seven horse. So, Christina, I'll just give you one last word on this one. Um, how heavily are you using Rock Your World? I'll use him on everything for sure. Because as I said, you know, coming into the Derby, it was between those two for me, known agenda, rock your world. It was the same for me coming into this race. I'm just kind of leaning on who I think is going to, you know, take to the pace scenario and to Belmont itself a little bit better. The only concern I have for rock your world is just if he gets a little lost on the lead, you know, he didn't, he didn't end up doing that in the Santa Anita Derby at all. And that was home. So hopefully he's, you know, professional enough to stay on task and Rosario can keep him kind of focused, but I think he has every bit of ability. Uh, I think as Scott pointed out, he might end up being the most talented horse in this crop. He's just been freaky in a lot of his races. So uh, I'm excited to see what he can do and he will be on all of my tickets. All right. I made the case for the horse on the outside overtook best case scenario. Christina, where does overtook finish? You could say last. I, yeah, I, have a, I mean, no, I'm not going to say last. <laughs> I don't see that. Uh, I, have a, I just don't think he has the class really against some of these horses. I mean, I can see him split the field, but I don't know. I, I, I don't know that the Peter, the Peter Pan in years past has been a good race when you're mm -hmm. talking about, you know, heading to the Belmont, but 
I don't see it with him any any better than maybe third, fourth, probably. For what it's worth, there was a time when Overtook finished third to known agenda. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Before known agenda had blinkers on. Right? <laughs> it was by and, 21. Uh, it was by 21. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and hey, whatever. <laughs> Details. Scott, any any chances where it sits the board for you? So ironically, that was the last time the, this horse ran with blinkers and they're adding them. I don't always like to see adding blinkers in a big stakes race like this um, kind of means that they're not really sure. I also think if the horse was that good, that Johnny V would have stayed aboard. Then mm-hmm. again, he was offered a great opportunity. So it's hard to say, you know, more of a known horse versus this. Um, but it, that's Todd's guy. So it's just, there's a lot of things. Um, but I'm also not completely convinced that that was an all out effort. So I think if you're correct about the distances getting longer and being a good thing, it might be a good horse to key in third and fourth to try to spice up your try and super. Cause it means if more than one horse try, does try to go for the lead, I mean, somebody's probably not going to survive that. So you're going to get, you're going to get something random in there. So, I mean, I don't hate it out of the horses that the only two I'm probably not going to use on any ticket are the, the five and the one. So, I mean, the eight would be the, the next one it, next one up for me to kind of spice things up down there. Okay. Fair enough. Um, all right. I, I think that just about covers it. Uh, it was a lot of fun as always. I um, want to remind people that uh, if you're watching this and, and you don't have a stats race lens subscription again, now would be the time to get one. Lots of great offers, equibase.com slash offers. Uh, the one the big one, if you've never had a subscription before, you can get a one month, trial uh for a dollar using promo code srlm1e there are other discounts there offering 40 percent off an unlimited annual subscription so check that out i'll go to equibase.com for more details all right so uh for now uh i'm dan torgman uh for christina blacker scott coles we wish you a very happy belmont stakes weekend and lots of luck we'll see you next time